A reasonably fair and workable legal system is always necessary for economic development and improvement of social conditions. But in the United States, that doesn't exist for Indian nations today, and the result is pervasive poverty, deprivation, and suffering. Casinos benefit really only a few tribes. Lawyers and courts had done virtually nothing to assure constitutional rights and fair treatment for Indian tribes. It was clear that we would have to do something different in order to overcome the incredibly unjust legal system and the system of federal control that had been entrenched for 150 years and still is so entrenched. We decided that we must listen to Indian nations that asked for our help and follow their decisions. We decided to work for Native peoples of the Americas, not just in the United States. Now, working for Indian nations means we were never trying to work alone. We were advising and assisting Indian and Alaska Native nations, sometimes many of them in several countries. That was important. We began a long-term strategy to overturn the antiquated and racist body of law that we found almost everywhere. We planned a long campaign of writing, education, lawsuits, and organizing aimed at changing the law. But we learned after years of work that the courts in this country were not open to any serious challenge to the legal system that affects Indian nations. The very Supreme Court that had ruled school desegregation unconstitutional also ruled that same year that the federal government is free to actually confiscate Indian tribes' property without due process and without any compensation. That's still the law in the United States. We needed an additional strategy for changing the laws. Some of the Indian nations that I was representing pointed out that they had never relinquished their rights as nations to participate in the international community. And so we began to look to the international community, to the United Nations, for ways to challenge the laws in the United States and elsewhere. The then newly, relatively newly emerging law of human rights at the international level was really promising because it condemned in no uncertain terms, discrimination, genocide, the denial of cultural rights, and other wrongs. In 1976, we had the opportunity to go to the home of human rights in, the, in Geneva, Switzerland, to the United Nations there. And I suggested to the Indian nations that I was working with at the time that they consider proposing to the United Nations a declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. I wrote a draft for them to consider. They did consider it, reviewed it, modified it, and took it to the United Nations in 1977 and proposed it to the United Nations for adoption. Our, our strategy was that by creating international awareness and pressure on the United States and other countries, we might be able to develop international legal standards about the rights of Indian nations and indigenous peoples we might be able to change the policies and practices of countries, and we might be able to persuade eventually the domestic courts and lawmakers to reevaluate their laws and policies. We had very difficult times. Our strategies were scoffed at in this country, at least. Many people said we'd never accomplish anything. We had a staff of just five or six, and our budget was never more than a few hundred thousand dollars a year. But the process in the United Nations soon became the largest and most heavily attended human rights process in the UN's history. For the first time, the affected people, the indigenous people, were permitted to participate in the human rights process, and they were enormously effective. Hundreds and hundreds of them went to the United Nations to negotiate and uh, advocate for the declaration. Our work on the declaration took 30 years until finally, as you heard, the General Assembly adopted it in 2007 and the United States gave its approval in 2010. Thank you. It made a big difference because the Declaration proclaimed for the first time that indigenous peoples have the right to exist 
the right to exist as distinct peoples. That was not the case before. The right to exist with their own governments, without discrimination of any kind, with the right to own their lands and resources and a host of other rights. This was a great change in the tide of history and it's changed how countries see indigenous peoples. Now in 2014, just a little, about two years ago, we helped to win four more major commitments from the United Nations General Assembly. We won commitments to develop a permanent monitoring and implementing body for the UN Declaration, to see that it's carried into effect. We won a commitment to create new rules in the UN that will permit Indian nations and other indigenous governments to participate on a permanent basis in the United Nations. After this, we won't have to have special permission to go and fight for our rights there. They'll be there all the time. We also got a commitment to combat violence against indigenous women, which you heard about in the video. That, by the way, speaking in the video, was our senior attorney, Jana Walker, who has accomplished remarkable things in the fight against violence against indigenous women. We also <laughs> won we also won a commitment from the United Nations to do more to encourage respect for indigenous sacred sites. On the domestic front, our project on violence against indigenous women helped to win a major change in United States law, as you heard in the, vi in the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. They used brilliant organizing, brilliant communications work, videos about the epidemic of violence against Native women and creative advocacy in international bodies. And they won the support of women all over the country who helped bring about a tremendous reform in United States law, returning law enforcement power to Indian governments in the United States, power to help prevent some forms of violence against Indian women, but much more needs to be done. We've litigated land claims. We've used federal courts to challenge federal government abuses and sometimes state government abuses. We've changed the United States laws in some important ways, but fundamentally, the unfair and racist legal framework is still in place, and we're continuing to challenge it. We're going to have to focus on education to educate a new generation of lawyers and judges, so we're writing materials to do that. It's going to take many more years to change the law. Assuring that the United Nations takes the necessary measures to implement the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to see to it that countries respect these rights is another priority for our work going forward. And now, we're going to have to implement the new American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples because, let me say, just four days ago, the Indian Law Resource Center staff here in D.C. and a handful of amazing Indian leaders from the Americas over here at the Organization of American States succeeded after 26 years of work, succeeded in completing the negotiations on the new American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it's stronger than the UN Declaration. Now that, yes, it was a tremendous job they did, and there were so few of them, but it had to be done, and they did it marvelously. That declaration is expected to be approved by the General Assembly of the Organization of American States in a few weeks in June. So we're looking forward to that. The greed for Indian resources uh, seems to have grown uh, in recent years, much more virulent. At the same time, we're seeing a breakdown of the rule of law in the Americas, a significant reduction in the willingness or ability of countries to enforce laws or to abide by them. These two factors are extremely dangerous for marginalized peoples such as indigenous peoples. As Indian communities have begun to assert the real legal rights that are being created, Indian leaders are being murdered in many countries.
This is a very alarming development, particularly in Central and South America. They're being murdered by those who covet these Indian lands and resources. It's a very urgent situation that we must address and must stop. We hope to train more Indian lawyers and Indian leaders, especially in Central and South America, to help them defend and assert their rights. I hope that perhaps we can create I hope that we can create an Indian Law Resource Center in that part of the world. I get moved by that because it's been a dream that we've been unable uh, to fulfill for many years, but perhaps we can do that soon. Fundraising concerns, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Fundraising concerns are serious. I'm worried that foundations seem to be trending toward just short-term projects. This isn't good. It took 30 years to get the UN Declaration, and it was worth it. 26 years to get the American Declaration. Serious work requires serious time. We need to educate philanthropy to be responsive. I think our greatest need, yes, we may need to look to individuals and families where foundations are falling down. For the long term, I think we need to focus more on education and modern communications work. We need to try to engender the rule of law in many countries, and by this I mean encouraging political and social systems uh, so that they are governed democratically by laws and not by the arbitrary dictates of individuals. Well, in this long-term view, I hope that we will see rich cultures and hundreds and thousands of indigenous communities thriving all around the world. But I also want to see a great body of rights, of fundamental rights, recognized for other peoples as well. This need not be just limited to indigenous peoples. I believe that most of the rights in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples should be the rights of all peoples of the world. So let's see if we can do something about that. Thank you very much.